Okay, thank you, thank you, Tommy, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, give a lecture on my research, one of my research topics, and I'm very glad to uh, come here and uh, to uh, talk with many of my colleagues, friends, and the students here. Uh, the quote that Tommy just apparently looked up in my website, which have yet to be updated, uh, is actually taken from Jerome Bussmeyer. Uh, he uh, claimed, or he said that life is complex because it has the both real and imaginary parts. Yeah. yeah. I have another quote, which I think on my uh, website, which I like, uh, which talks about modeling, actually. Modeling, um, uh, so they say, uh, the, the story goes that, say, okay, so uh, trains in Austria usually run late. So one day a passenger kind of uh, you know, waited on the train in, in the train station and, say, and then complained about this and asked, well, if, if the trains are always late, well, he complained to the station master. He said, if, if the trains are always late, why do you, you know, have to print out the, the, the timetable, what's the use of timetable? And then the uh, station master looked at him and said, okay, without the timetable, how do you know the train is late? I think this is quite uh, an interesting remark in terms of the way how models and the data interact. We build models to some extent to serve as a kind of a benchmark, a way of thinking about the data, to think about the underlying process. So, uh, okay, with that, I, I would like to just you know, go to a, uh, just talk about, as uh, Tommy said, my background, you know, coming out from somebody who actually first studies uh, physics theoretical physics in, uh, in China, and, uh, and then got a, a PhD in neuroscience, and, uh, and then uh, now in a psychology uh, department with a goal of modeling a psychological process, modeling the mind. So, and uh, the approach which I have taken uh, is trying to look at the mind as a kind of a computational kind of a uh, device which runs a kind of a software on a neural hardware, okay? It's a particular kind of a view on computational intelligence, and uh, therefore have this quote of mind, machine, and mathematics. I've done a variety of work, but today the topic I'll be talking about is so-called the theory of mind, okay, theory of mind. Um, the theory of mind, the notion of theory of mind has its uh, uh, particular kind of a, a meaning, you know, in developmental psychology or in psychology in general, has evolved as a core domain for uh, cognition, a core domain for cognition. Uh, Here's a quote from uh, Henry Wellman's uh, book. Uh, basically, it just says that, uh, well, we have this lay view about, say, our perception, which forms the basis of our belief, and uh, we have uh, basic uh, emotions or underlying neurophysiology, which uh, give rise to our desire. And then based on our belief, uh, belief and desire, we uh, take actions, and then we get reactions from uh, others and from our environment and therefore you know this uh, the, the whole uh, from perception belief uh, emotion desire action and so forth we have a generic kind of a theory about this belief desire psychology so and this uh, emerges uh, in the study of uh, uh, human cognition developmental uh, cognition development of cognition and very early on in a child's life uh, he or she would need to acquire this kind of a general model of uh, the notion of uh, a mind, a okay, notion of a mind. So um, the theory of mind type of reasoning, that, that is to see reasoning about the beliefs and desire and the actions, uh, can be looked at from a more formal perspective via the so-called game theory. Well, game theory emerges out of uh, economics. It's a framework for model interpersonal strategic interaction. So the basic ingredients of a game is that you have a set of players, a set of players who individually can take actions and based on the joint actions of these individual players, there is an outcome. So in other words, an outcome is a result of the combined action of all the players. Okay. Now, given an outcome, different players can have different values or payoffs for these outcomes, okay? So the outcomes are determined by actions of all the players and the values that of each of the outcomes or the outcome that's uh, resulted is valued differently or possibly differently by all the different players. So you have this player, outcome, and payoff, which are the basic ingredients for the game. Now, in terms of the solutions for the game, 
Okay, the, the formal uh, game theoretic solutions of the game, uh, people have various notions. One, for instance, the notion of uh, best reply, uh, which involves a modeling of the other person's action and trying to devise a best response to the actions of others. Equilibrium, the idea of equilibrium is that you somehow, this, uh, the joint uh, reasoning of the players leads to uh, a state in which no, no individuals would like to deviate from that, state of, from that state of affairs. So I'm going to get into more details a little bit later on. In the economic studies of the game, there's some fundamental assumptions being made. Okay? And these assumptions are the axioms of common knowledge. That is, so each player would know the structure of the game, know the players, know their actions, and know the payoffs, know the structure of the game. And this is all common knowledge. Now, being common knowledge, that is to say, the players know the structure, the nature, the process of the game, and knows that the other players also know the uh, strategies, the, outcome, the payoffs of the game, and knows that other players know that they know the, the game structure and so forth. So this is a part of the common knowledge. So you know something, you know others know something, and you know that others know that you know something, and et cetera. Okay, so it forms a common knowledge. And this axiom of common knowledge is very important, plays an important role in, for instance, for uh, the notion of the Nash equilibrium, for the equilibrium idea. And then along with that is the notion of the rationality, the axiom of rationality. In other words, players tend to act rationally. Now here's a little bit trouble about this notion of the rationality in this case of the games, okay? And this is a, a, the, one of the questions that uh, we are going to address, a part of this uh, notion of the rationality. What we submit and what we argue is that we can, while we can well define the notion of the so-called instrumental rationality, that is to say, once we have a model of the game situation, a model of the other players action in the game, then we can act rationally as a best response, as a best action out of our model. Okay? But nevertheless, this model itself, the modeling of others in the game setting, is a much more involved process. It involves a recursive kind of a reasoning uh, which uh, uh, is yet to be explored. Okay? So let me just give some uh, a, a detailed exposition of these uh, concepts in the, uh, for the case of, say, for instance, uh, the prison dilemma game, okay, and then the notion of the Nash equilibrium in the prison dilemma game. So a prison dilemma game, as shown on the right, uh, this is I'm uh, adapting the, the strategies to uh, say you have two players, uh, each can have a choice of being selfish or altruistic, okay, and the numbers in the cells represent the payoffs to these individuals with a smaller number meaning less of the value and larger number being more or high of the value. Okay, so five is more than three and more than one, more than zero, okay? So now if both players act altruistically, say you can get, say for both players, you can get three points, okay? But if one player acts selfishly and the other, player, the, uh, the other person acts altruistically, the player who plays selfish would get five points, whereas the person who plays altruistically would get zero points. Okay? And if both play selfishly, then they both get one, one point. Okay? So this is a standard setting for a so-called prison dilemma game. Okay? So for this game, if, uh, this has uh, puzzled many, many people. For this kind of a game, if you do uh, an analysis as to what players would do, what people would do in this kind of setting, okay? and, uh, the game theoretic analysis, say, uh, uh, for instance, the Nash equilibrium, the notion of Nash equilibrium basically claims that, or says that, well, the, how people would choose would be in the state of affair in which nobody would want to unilaterally deviate. So, in other words, if somehow the players have chosen a particular strategy, and knowing that other players have chosen that strategy, no player has the incentive to unilaterally deviate. In other words, to change if the other player would not change, okay? So let's give uh, a, a look at this. For instance, this 3-3 uh, three, three cell, the 3-3 three, three cell, that cell would not be a Nash equilibrium, okay? Because if, you, if we are in this 3-3 three, three cell, now the role player, the role player would change to D3, 
the other strategy, the selfish strategy, while gaining more points, becoming a three, become a five. Okay? And likewise, the column player would also want to deviate from his or her choice to get a five. So three, three, the cooperative solution for this prison dilemma game is not a Nash equilibrium. Whereas the one, one, the selfish, selfish, or the non-cooperative solution, that is a Nash equilibrium because nobody would like to deviate unilaterally without damaging him or herself, okay? without getting a lower payoff. Okay? So that's the notion of the Nash equilibrium. So, well, one way to explain uh, this, uh, uh, like, the, or the, the solve this so-called uh, these games, the prison dilemma game, is they say you can use this Nash equilibrium-based idea, which is basically uh, saying that uh, it's a mutual best response to one another based on, uh, like, a theory of mind kind of a modeling of what others would do. That is to say, others will stick, say, uh, whether others would uh, stick with their choice. Uh, this is the foundation for the Nash equilibrium, a unilateral deviation. Now, uh, extensive uh, uh, psychological research uh, showed that the, this notion of the Nash equilibrium would not be uh, valid uh, in, you know, actually, human when they, when they are engaged in those games. Okay. So, uh, instead, well, so, so, so here is just a, a, what this is showing that the that one one is would be the Nash equilibrium in this case, deviating uh, would be would not uh, nobody would uh, want to unilaterally deviate. Now, another notion in uh, solving the game is the notion of so-called a dominant strategy. Dominant strategy, a dominating a dominating strategy is a strategy such that regardless of what others do, okay, regardless of what others do, it's better for the player to choose one strategy versus the other, one action versus the other, okay? So now, in this case, if you look at the choices of the two players here, you will soon realize that the cell, one, one cell, the selfish, selfish cell, is actually a dominating strategy for both players, for the both row and column player. In other words, for the row and column players, for the players in this game, you do not need to know what other person would have chosen. Okay, it is always better for you to choose selfish. Okay, because why? Because if the person, if the other person choose selfish, of course you should choose selfish. But if the other person choose or choose sick, you should also choose selfish because it gets you higher points for this game. Okay, so the one one solution, that um, non cooperative solution, is actually very very stable because it is a combination of the dominating strategies of the two players. A dominating strategy is one that does not rely on a modeling of the other. You really don't even need um, to kind of extensively model the other player, but just by an analysis of this, you're always better off in choosing a dominating strategy. So for the prison dilemma game, the only way when you can actually get out of this non-cooperative solution, so, okay, so the question is when would the uh, cooperative solution, when, when would cooperation in the prison dilemma game would, uh, can be individually rational? Can be rational to the individual, uh, to the or, or to the players themselves, okay, as an instrumental rational kind of strategy. Well, it turns out that the only way to for that to happen is when you are not playing this as a single shot game, okay, and you have to uh, play. Uh, you have to assume there is a probability of continuation. There is a probability of continued interaction. So the probability, non-zero probability of continued interaction, is a uh, necessary condition for this prison dilemma game to evolve a cooperative solution, okay? So basically, in those cases, now the individually, the rational, a rational player would maximize a total expected uh, payoff and taking into account of the probability of continuation, of continued interaction. What happens is that when that is taken into account, then you can basically transform the payoff values of your actions and what happens in this case is that your play, your actual choice in the current game, not only will give you give rise to some immediate payoff, but also would lead, would also influence the other person's choice for future games in the future in future rounds of the same game. So therefore, your action not only impact your immediate reward, immediate gain, but also impact on how others would act for future games. So, so therefore. Uh, the cooperation may arise 
Okay. So it turns out that if you, after very rigorous analysis of this sort, one can show that the time, the, the, one of the, uh, the sufficient condition for this to happen is when the continuing probability have to exceed certain amount of threshold. So to rationally solve prison dilemma game, one requirement is that you would have to have continued interaction or continued uh, a presumed probability or expectation of continued interaction. Okay. So that kind of shows that you know, all this kind of a cooperative solution in the prison dilemma game would rely on that kind of expectation, which may be uh, neurobiologically grounded into the brain you know, through evolution, for instance. Okay? So that's a national, that is a rational solution for cooperation. Now, I'm not going to expand on this type of analysis uh, uh, for the prison dilemma game and how cooperation arrived in this, and I have some theoretical results, theoretical uh, paper on this. But rather today, I'm going to talk about a related issue about this recursive depth in this theory of mind reasoning. Uh, a recursion in theory of mind reasoning. Okay, so uh, to to uh, e explain what that is, I'm going to give you an example, uh, the so-called P beauty context game. Okay, now suppose uh, you have a so you, we have say all the audience here. Okay, so suppose I ask you to submit a number between zero and one hundred. Okay, a number between zero and one hundred, and you're going to write on the piece of paper and hand it to me. I'm going to collect all the papers and I'm going to do an average of all of the numbers that you submitted, okay? And then I'm going to multiply two thirds of that average. So I get some number, right? After multiplying two thirds of the average, I get some number. Now, the rule of the game is that whoever submits the number which is closest to my, to the two thirds of my average, okay? Two thirds of this average, and not exceeding that, that person would win win the game, okay? So everybody had a chance, say for instance, to submit a number between zero and 100. You can submit any number. To make it simple, you can maybe just submit an integer, okay? And I'm gonna take an average of this and multiply two thirds, and that's my target number. You're gonna shoot for the target number. Whoever that gets closest to that number would win, the, say, a big prize. I, I actually run this uh, for my, for my uh, mathematical psychology class and by actually running this uh, experiment and saying that whoever that wins this really can get a boost in their grade, okay? So now, if, if you run this sort of game, and just first think about this, what number would you submit? Okay, so suppose this is a very important kind of a you know, uh, consequence for you. What number would you submit? Okay, so I want you to think maybe for one, one minute, maybe half a minute, maybe. So I have some 30 here, right? 30, okay. Some. Okay, so actually, let's go through the, some of the reasoning that you may have in thinking about what number to submit. Okay, now, in order to win this game, right? I'm trying to submit, so everyone will submit between zero to 100, but I'm gonna take the average and do two thirds to it. So the number, the average which I get cannot be more than 67. Right? Assuming everybody submits 100, I'm average 100, the two thirds of that is 67. So there's no way I can win by submitting anything above 67, right? Because I need to be below my target number. So, so I should not submit anything above 67, okay? But now realizing that maybe the person that's just next to me thinks the same thing, right? They realize that too. So they think nobody will submit anything above 67. So, well, then if everybody submits 67, I'm going to take two thirds of 67, which is 44. So maybe I should submit like 30, 44, okay? So, right? So you can do, so, and then, and then I realize, so I, other people may realize the same thing, so I can, well, I have to redo my, you know, calculations, so forth, so I go submit 29 and so forth. If you keep doing like this, very soon you will find out the best thing to submit is zero, <laughs> okay? So this is an example of so-called this uh, recursive uh, reasoning, recursive reasoning, okay, this recursion, the theory of mind recursion, because you think what others would think, you think what others think that you would think, and so forth, okay. Now, obviously, well, I actually ran this experiment, you know, when my class and others have run this experiment, turns out that people would never submit zero, or very few people, there are people who submit zero anyway, but, uh, but not all, but you can argue, well, maybe, it's not people maybe random, maybe the number they think about maybe is 50, you know, this in the middle, and then two thirds of that is like 33, right? Maybe that's where the 33 come about because then, so, so uh, now, 
uh, it turns out that such experiment has been has been run on subjects on, um, in various contexts. Uh, they ran this uh, with some uh, uh, college students in German in Germany. Okay, the average number they get is like thirty five. And uh, they ran some Caltech students, which is 24. That's one level kind of deeper, you know, one level down. And then they have run other, you know, more prestigious kind of uh, subject groups, like readers of Financial Times London, okay? They actually gave out real prize for that, okay? So forever, so they opened up a window for, say, two weeks for submission, and then they were going to tally the results, and they're going to give out actual monetary reward for the for the person that that, that that does the best, okay. So it turns out that in for that group, I mean the numbers they submit is, is always between like twenty four and thirty five, okay. So that's the the mode of. I mean there's a whole spectrum of the numbers being submitted, but the the, the mode of, of that, okay. So which indicates that people actually do no more than like two or third level of recursion, or even maybe. Depending on your interpretation of data, it can be between zero and one. Okay, I mean one and two because if you think everybody starts out with fifty. Okay, so so uh, this level of recursion of like how deep people go into in, in real like social interaction so forth is the of interest uh, here. So so uh, so over the years, I have uh, well, I mean, I look when I uh, first studied, I looked into the literature about uh, how they measure the depths of recursive reasoning. So it turns out that existing uh, paradigms for measure this kind of like recursive depth is uh, either through the so-called uh, dominant solvable games, uh, through iterated removal of this, uh, this uh, strategy in the dominantly solvable games. And what they do is that they always run uh, a few games, but against many, many subjects. And, uh, and so for these games, well, you can argue that if a subject is faced with many, many different subjects, in doing this kind of reasoning, then they will have a generic, they will have a model of the strategic sophistications of the population, right? So that may be the reason why you no know, people don't even go to like zero in this PPUD context game. So because, well, think about this. Even though you think theoretically or the, the equilibrium solution is zero, you may not think that other people may not have thought about that. So I mean, there's a a distribution of the strategic sophistication that leads you to say, oh, maybe I'll just get like 24 or 35 or something. Okay, so that's the explanation for that. So uh, even though you can't or you are able to reason in a great depth, maybe you are just not doing that because you expect you, your model of the general population is such that there's a distribution of the depths of this recursion. Okay. Now, uh, so the depths or order of recursion. Uh, in order to study that in a very uh, you know, individual uh, social interaction and dynamic setting, we propose a paradigm in which we have a series of uh, trial unique games uh, with a di diagnostic payoff structure, a diagnostic payoff structure that would allow us to differentiate this order or depth of recursion. Okay. And this uh, paradigm has uh, since been adopted uh, with some modification by uh, a variety of other groups uh, as to probe this depth of recursion. And uh, I'm going to explain to you what that paradigm is. Okay. Now, the paradigm works in the following way. Uh, so we have a game, it, it's a three-step game. It's a three-step game. So, the, so uh, we have two player, player one, player two. Uh, the game starts with A and then B, C, D. So it can move to B, to C, then to D, where there are four cells. And uh, so the numbers, as before, uh, represents the payoffs to the players where the first number goes to the uh, player one, and the second number goes to player two. Okay? And uh, player one controls the first and the third move, and player two controls the second move. So this is a sequentially played game, a sequential game. So you start out in, say, in cell A, and player A controls the first move. So player, I mean, player one controls the first move. Player one can decide whether to stay in, player, uh, in cell A and collect the reward, uh, collect the points, or decide to move on to, player, uh, to cell B and then pass the control and to pass the control to uh, player two. So once the, if uh, player one decides to move to uh, cell B and it's player two's turn to decide whether to stay at cell B and collect the reward or to move the piece to cell C and let player one 
have the final say, okay? So they think about either to stay there or to move. If then player one, uh, player two starts to, uh, decides to move to uh, cell C, then player one had another chance to either stay at C or move to D, and that's, that's it, okay? So whoever, whichever player decides to stop, then the game ends in that cell, and each player would collect the respective payoff, okay? And as you can see, the numbers of this, uh, the, the numbers differ in four cells, in these four cells for the two players, and also they differ from uh, game to game. This payoff matrix is trial unique in the sense that uh, the uh, players only encounter that once in the whole experiment. So now, this sequential move game, uh, there are a maximum of three steps with four possible outcome. And uh, so if you draw out in a kind of a, a game, like a game tree diagram, you can see that player one uh, controls the first and third, and player two uh, controls the second move, and uh, yeah, these are the payoff values and so forth. So we instruct the players such that the game is non-cooperative. Non-cooperative in the sense they are only to uh, uh, they are to earn, the goal is to earn as many points as possible for themselves and not to worry how much the other player, their opponents earns or their co-players earns. Okay. So uh, the questions we ask our subjects are as follows. We ask them two questions in a sequence. Okay. First, we ask the subject, what would player two do if the game progresses to cell B? Okay. So what would player two do if the game, if the game progresses to cell B? And then we ask them the question, what would player one do in cell A, given, given their, you know, uh, the question one, given the answer to the question one, okay? So the first question is basically a, a modeling of what would happen. And the second question is translate that model into a rational action, okay, into a rational action. So let's give an, uh, let's take this as an example, okay? I want, uh, so one of this game, uh, so we have these payoff numbers. I want you to kind of look at this and see what would you, you know, how would you answer these questions, okay? So now, what would player two do in cell B, okay? With this payoff matrix, right? So whether the player two would move or would stay, okay? So that's the question, okay? So are there people who think they should move? Yeah. Oh, okay, so we do have move and stay, right? Okay, okay, so, so you want to ask then, okay, so now, so now if, uh, say, in, we're in cell B now, whether we should, whether player two should move or should stay, right? So they think, well, because player two already has a three, but there's a potential of getting a four if uh, he or she moves, right? Getting four. Uh, then, if you think further, player one had the final chance of deciding whether to stay in cell C or move away from cell C, right? So one would all to try to think whether it makes sense for player one to move away from cell C or to stay at cell C upon the final move, okay? So in this case, player one would get a one by staying C and get a two in D. So if the game had progressed to cell C, player one would, have, would want to move to D. Right? So therefore, player two would not want to move away from cell B because there's no way the game can end in cell C. Okay? So, but you can see already in this type of reasoning or in answering the question, you invoke a kind of a, a theory of mind reasoning, a theory of mind reasoning. Namely, you would, so you can reason on the one hand saying that, okay, so player two would think, would think well, because it's better off for uh, in, in the, the, the payoff in, uh, in C than B, so it should move that way. But on the other hand, if the player two thinks what player one would do, okay, so therefore uh, in from C to D, then player two should not move, right? So you already see this kind of a recursive, recursive reasoning, okay? So, we, so in one case, a myopic kind of a reasoning would say uh, player two would move because you can get a four, but a more kind of a, a predictive reasoner would say player one I mean, a player two would not move from move away from from B, right? Because otherwise, because player one here would uh, want to move from C to D if 
he or she has a chance in there. So this level of recursion can be reviewed as to what, um, what, what, how you answer that particular question. Okay? And then given that answer, you can say, what would be the uh, rational thing to do for uh, player one in cell A? Right? So the right, what would be the rational thing to do? Well, you just need to translate that model into uh, the action here. Okay? So these are the two questions we ask. For this particular game, this is a diagnostic game, a diagnostic game in the sense that depending on the level of recursion, whether the, um, our subject is reasoning myopically or predictively, you give uh, opposite answers to the question whether player two would move from B or not. Right? So it's diagnostic. Now compared with this game here, uh, we have another set of payoff values here. Okay? So in this case, a myopic uh, player two, well, if you think myopically, if you think myopically, when player two is in uh, cell B, then they should, they should not move, right? Because if, if you, otherwise they would get a one, decreasing their, their points. Also, if you think deeply, or predictively, okay, even if, so if you think deeply, that means player one would not move away from C to D because there's a two over one, okay? So for that reason, you should not move, okay? So the two, the, the, these two answers, whether you, in, you are engaged in myopic reasoning or predictive reasoning would give rise to the same answer. So this is a game that is non-diagnostic. There's non-diagnostic. So we have classes of games which on the one hand is diagnostic, on the other hand is non-diagnostic. But for the non-diagnostic games, games, we use them as a way to uh, serve as, as our so-called catch trials, catch trials, because we want the subjects to engage in reasoning, in, in our subjects to engage in this reasoning, and if they somehow they are not paying attention to the payoff numbers, they're just randomly choosing and so forth, they will get those wrong, okay? So we use them as catch trials. So our block of the games would mix the diagnostic games with the non-diagnostic game, and using that non-diagnostic games as catch games, catch trials. Okay. Now, so we have diagnostic and non-diagnostic game, and uh, we have four strategically distinct types of diagnostic games. Uh, based on the payoff values, there are four different kinds of uh, games and uh, we balance, we counterbalance everything in terms of the predictions about uh, say yes, no, they will move away, they will not move away. And we also counterbalance about their risk attitude about uh, whether you should move uh, if I start with a higher payoff, whether you should, um, I start with lower payoff and I wouldn't move if I start with a higher payoff or this heuristic kind of risk attitude, we make everything counterbalanced. So in this case, the player strategy, as I said, may either play myopically or predictively as cell B, and play one's model or player two can either be myopic or predictive, and, uh, and player one's choice at cell A would depend on this model. And uh, now in the actual experiment, we assign our uh, either player one or player two, uh, one of them as, uh, of course, is our subject, but the other is the experiment confederate. We instruct the confederate to perform according to uh, our instructions, and these are the experimental manipulations. So now our design, so we have a total of 24 games. Oh, no, I'm sorry, we, we start with 24 games as training for uh, training the subjects to familiarize them with the game, and these are very simple you know, payoff structures, so the subject would have no problem in deciding whether to, you know, uh, what player two would do in cell B, move or not move. And uh, then we have two test blocks, uh, each with 20 games. We have 16 diagnostic games, uh, interleaved with four catch, trial, and nine diagnostic ones. And all games are uh, unique with trial, uh, you know, those with distinct payoff numbers, payoff structures, so they only encounter that once in the experiment. And to avoid heuristics, we uh, block, like, all the games that start with a two and with all the games that start with a three in separate blocks to avoid uh, an inference of the risk attitude. So we'll have a total of 64 games all presented, presented in the fixed order. Now, subjects uh, are assigned either as player one or player two. So it's a between subject design. 
The reason we want to uh, uh, do a different assignment is that we want to test this so-called perspective taking. Because we ask the same question, same kind of question, but we want the subject to be in different shoes to assume the role of player one or player two. This is experimental manipulation. The opponent is always an experimental confederate. Um, and uh, the games are actually played out by computer. We, we actually have a confederate that sits with when they come in, introduce to each other, and interact with our subjects, and then go to different rooms and play the game. So subjects, they are asked to uh, answer these two following questions in a fixed order. So the first question is, uh, whether, what's player two's optimal strategy, SLB? And question two is, player one's optimal strategy, SLA. Yes. They, we give them free, you know, uh, they can think as, as much time as they want, but once they're familiarized with the game, they, it took them like a few seconds to, to do it. And usually, and these are the intro psych uh, subject you know, pool. And uh, we, uh, we recruit from there, and they always want to get out of the you know, experiment as, as quick as possible. I mean, we allowed about one or two hours for the experimental blocks. So the two questions, uh, the re so the first question is about the optimal strategy. This is a reasoning question. This is a we call a, a, or a anticipa anticipation question or third person. Well, when the when the uh, subject assigned as player one, then this is an anticipa an anticipation question or third person perspective. So we ask that question: where, whether the opponent would move if the game progresses to cell B. So whether whether the opponent would move if the cell progresses to B, and whether you will move away from cell A. This is question two. Okay, so. On the other hand, if the subject is assigned as player two, and this is really their planning for their move in cell B, okay, and then we ask whether you will move if the game progresses to cell B, and whether it is smart for the opponent to move away from cell A. Okay, so same question, but ask phrase slightly differently to make the subject reason different, to take different perspectives based on their assignment. The first question is, is referred to as the theory of mind or the Tom model question. And the second question is an instrumental rationality question. Uh, for data analysis, uh, first we exclude uh, unmotivated or uh, uh, confused subjects from uh, our data analysis uh, based on their performance on the training you know, games and also on the catch trials. So after this exclusion, we have uh, 28 subjects playing uh, player one and 36 subjects playing uh, player two as player two. Okay? It's a between subject design. Now, and then the, to score uh, their choices for the first question, uh, a myopic choice would be scored as zero, a predictive choice would be scored as one. And uh, to score the second question on instrumental rationality, if their choice is consistent with what their mental model, where their theory of mind model is, then we score that as being no rationality error or zero. Otherwise, we scored it as one or rationality error. So the rationality error is scored, or the rationality uh, performance is scored with respect to their theory of mind model that they have. Okay. And scores for four successive games are averaged. We call a game set, so that it will give rise to a predictive score from 0 0.25 and up to 1, 1.0. Okay. So if they act predictively for all four games of the game set, then they get a score of one. Otherwise, you, know, you can just see the proportion of time they act predictively. So now here's the data. So uh, this is a distribution of this predictive score for the individual, uh, for, for the subjects when they are assigned as player one on the left and player two on the right. Okay? So, the different shades represent the predictive score, and the height of the, the bar represents the, the amount of subjects, total percent 100. Okay. So as you can see, uh, in both cases, the subject starts out as being have a relatively low predictive score. That is to say, they play relatively kind of myopically. Okay. There's very few people who play, like who have a score of say one in the very beginning. 
And gradually, as the game progresses, okay, you see the distribution changes. So there's a growth of the number of people who score higher and higher. Okay. And this is the case both for the uh, subjects as player one and subjects as player two. So in the case, they are actually, through their interaction with the same subject, they are learning something. They are, they are, in, they are enhancing their model. Okay. Now, in the data that I show you, the subjects, uh, the confederate, which is, uh, they always act predictively. Okay? The, the confederate always act predictively. This is the, uh, the data when we average across the entire, uh, we average across the population. So we, the previous slide shows you the distribution of the number of subjects with the various predicted score. This is averaging across the whole population. Okay? As you can see, the scores, the predictive scores would increase okay, as the interaction with uh, the opponent as player one, so this they increase, and towards the end they get a score of like 0.65 uh, or so, 0 0.64, 0 0.65. As player two, they get a much higher score too, like 0.9. Or something, okay, of course, play, uh, the second condition, uh, player two condition, it is a case where the subjects are taking the shoes of the other person, so they're reasoning. So effectively, it's the reasoning with one level of recursion huh, in answering the first question, right? So now, this kind of a pattern, if you count, uh, look at, compare with the, the rationality score, the rationality score is the question about where, what would player one do in first sale, right? So it turns out that there's not much difference between player one and player two in the rationality score, in the instrumental rationality, in applying the, the theorem my model to come up with the optimal choice, and come up with optimal choice, okay? So there's not much difference in in terms of the uh, role, the uh, assigned role. So the rationality error and decreased slightly after the, uh, in the second block. So the four game sets, and then there's a break, there's a second block. So they decrease slightly in the second block, but uh, there's no difference between uh, the, the, uh, the assignment of, of a player one and player two. Uh, furthermore, we measured the response time Okay, so we measure the response time for the subjects engaging in this task. Okay, so we, we look at the time it takes for them to answer these two questions. Okay, so on the left, this is the subjects assigned as player one. So these two bars, this is the their time to answer the first question, and these two bars, the time to answer the second question. Now we sort these answers according to whether the answer is Based, uh, is uh, consistent with a, a myopic model or a predictive model. In other words, whether the answer to the question is consistent with a predictive or deeper reasoning or myopic, myopic or shallow reasoning. Okay? And with the, uh, the, the uh, hypothesis that if you engage in a recursive theorem of reasoning, you add basically one more step to that. It will take you longer to come to that conclusion. So therefore, reaction time would be longer. Okay? So this uh, is Born out, as you can see, if there is a predictive reasoning, then it takes a, a few seconds lo longer. It takes a few seconds more than if you reason like myopically. Okay, this compare with the case where your answer to the second question, the instrumental rationality, that is converting your model, your prediction of what's happened in cell B to what you should have in cell A. Okay, the reaction time. Virtually, there's no difference between whether this uh, is based on myopic or predictive model. Okay? The same pattern occurred when player is assigned as player two. Okay? So basically, one extra step of recursion would cost a few more seconds. Okay? So this is the reaction time data that, su that supports this idea that, in, in fact, they are engaged in this kind of a recursive uh, or you know, deep versus shallow reasoning. Now, next, we look at the statistics about their performance of individual subjects uh, as the game progresses. Now, as the game progresses, it turns out that some subjects, may, they may start out by reason myopically, but eventually towards the end, they, kind of, they, they realize that they, 
they had maybe an aha moment in the middle, and they say, yeah, they switched to a predictive mode of reasoning. Okay, so we measured, so we measured the like the switch point. If you look at their choice pattern, so we measured the time by which they they did the switch to become uh, predictive. Okay, and we do this for both the subject assigned as player one and the subject assigned as player two. Okay, so we look at the switch in time. Okay, turns out that this switching time dynamics do not differ across the row assignment. Okay, going from our pick to predictive. Okay, so in other words, this learning or the acquisition of this you know, recursive thinking or that it happened, it occurred to them they should actually think that way, think kind of one more step. Okay, that acquisition is independent of the row assignment. Uh, of the subject. But it does matter in terms of whether any subject would convert, would actually switch. Okay? So it turns out that in the end, if the subjects are assigned as player one, only 43% of the subjects get converted, acquire this kind of depth, deep reasoning. Okay? Whereas if they, they're assigned as player two, there are 64% of uh, the subjects get converted. So this ratio of conversion differs by the row, uh, row assignment, indicating that indeed this change of perspective, a perspective change, in other words, asking the subjects to act as player two, assigned to be assigned as player two, does help them okay, in reasoning predictively. Okay? Now, there is a kind of a, a caveat in this kind of interpretation, but uh, whoops. Because one possible uh, interpretation or a, a, a way to you know, interpret this pattern of data could also be like, see, maybe the subjects did not realize that the game has like a final step, the third step. Okay? So the final step, so maybe it's, this has to do with the uh, kind of a reasoning horizon or decision horizon, like how far ahead you look. Okay? Maybe when they're reasoning what player two would do from cell B to C, they may not have reasoned far enough between to uh, consider the possibility what happens with C to D. Okay? So this kind of horizon. So, so this pattern can also be consistent with the fact that there may be a, a change of realization of the uh, a decision horizon or reasoning horizon. But nevertheless, the, this difference of these two numbers clearly shows that there is a benefit for reflexive reasoning by perspective taking. Okay? With a perspective switch, there is a benefit. You're more likely to engage in a deeper level of recursion. And this is almost by definition, definition about a recursive level. Okay, okay and then uh, we also uh, looked at the effect of the opponent strategy, the opponent strategy. So uh, what our experimental confederate would, uh, how his or her action can impact the Tom model, the theorem model. Okay, so in this case, um, the opponent either would say, like in this case, the opponent would uh, on the top would not switch, so either be consistently played myopically or consistently consistently played myopically or consistently played predictively. Okay. So we want to see how our subjects would respond to this kind of a player. Okay. So when the opponent plays consistently predictively, our subject kind of catches up, you know, gradually, on average gradually, just increase their level, the theory of mind level of the opponent, mirroring the performance of I mean, the actual behavior of the opponent. On the other hand, if the opponent acts consistently myopically, then you see the tone model stays at the lower level, okay? Which means that subjects are able to dynamically adjust their model of, the, of their opponent, okay? throughout the experiment. Now, this is when we actually have the opponent switch their strategy from a myopic to a predictive and from predictive to myopic. Okay. So the, during the first block, the op opponent acts kind of a, you know, predictively. So this is the uh, data with here. So in the first block, the subjects, I mean, the opponent acts predictively. So they have to, our subject would have to follow a model, a model or to model them predictively. But during the second block, we instruct the opponent to switch, to act myopically. And then as a result, the subject's 
model of the opponent also switch. You can see the predicted score kind of goes down. Okay. On the other hand, this is to be contrasted with when the opponent first starts out as being myopically in the first block, and in the second block, they become predictively. So you see this kind of increase, and there is a crossover. There is a crossover between these two. So this data shows that the subjects, they are, our subjects are actually dynamically constructing and adjusting their theorem and model of the opponent. right? And their prediction mirrors the way that opponent acts in these games. OK, so uh, to conclude, uh, we investigate the depths in theorem mind reasoning. And uh, we have a default. So basically, the subjects seem to start out with a default myopic model. But then they are able to modify that with the dynamic interaction with the opponent. Okay. And perspective taking would affect this kind of a, the likelihood of engaging in this predictive reasoning. So there is a cost for uh, taking a third person perspective compared with the first person perspective. Okay. There's a cost of uh, uh, taking third person perspective. And, but the perspective taken does not affect the time to acquire this predictive model. Okay. This is a, it's a reaction time data for the recursive depths is consistent with this, I, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the fact that they are actually reasoning with depths uh, recursion. On the side of the instrumental rationality, we say that the performance on the, on the second question shows that the uh, rationality error, the, instrument, the rationality analysis, instrumental rationality, they are not affected by a change of perspective. And also, they are not affected by a change of the opponent's strategy. So they seem to be uh, suggesting that depths of Tom recursion and instrumental rationality they may constitute two separate modules or two separate processes for this theorem mind reasoning. Okay. So uh, to conclude my presentation, uh, I just give this motto of the day, which is, we more readily account for others' reaction to an action we plan than we realize that others, when planning their action, may have already accounted for our possible counter-reaction. Okay. This is from a, a my favorite, like uh, the sorting hat in the Harry Potter story, and which these days I'm watching that with my son, and I really love this kind of widget, you know. So we more readily account for others' reaction to an action we plan, then we realize that others, when planning their action, may have already accounted for our possible counter reactions. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's one. Okay. Yes. Please. How do you make sure the subjects are clear about the rule of the game? Like the learning curve may involve like the subject graduate learns about the rule of the game rather than really the game. Right, good question. So we have the twenty four training game. The training so before they play all these games, they have they play twenty four training game which the payoffs are very simple. So in other words, say for instance the payoff for player two from B C D is like one, two, three. So if they understand the rule of the game, they should know, they should answer that very, very correctly. So we use, we give them the training games, and we look at the performance of, uh, in the last, say, eight games of the training game. And, uh, and that also we couple with uh, these catch trials. So these are the ones we use to basically screen out the subject. Right, so yes. Yeah. Yes. Has there been any um, sort of correlation between, say, the size of the group that's asked the question? Mm. Uh, yeah, 
yeah, uh, it's a good question, but I, I'm not aware of, uh, I mean, I, I don't know much about the empirical literature on that question, about the size dependency on this, yeah. So the empirical kind of answer to the level is normally two to three, not, not even f like three to, not two to three, what, but depends on what you count as, say, the zero level or the first level, because you can say, you know, maybe everybody submit like 15 instead of, right? So you can then, at, like the first level would be, you know, the zeroth level would be 50, you know, and by two, I mean, for, the zeroth level would really be 33, you know, because two thirds of that, and then, right? So, so there's some arguments, so you can always have the, like one level off, but normally it's like uh, the argument has been like two to three, you know, and, and uh, we look at this, in, this is even like one to two, in our game only investing one to two steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Yes. Ah, so in other words, whether they learn, they learn to be kind of a, to be recursive once you. Uh, it's a good question, and I've been thinking about just using these as like training, training games. Yes, uh, I've been thinking about using these as you know, the training for the recursion, uh, but then so. There's one issue that we need to resolve first in terms of you know, why people say start up with say like the myopic game, right? I mean myopic model of the opponent, or maybe just maybe this is not you no, know, they it's kind of a cognitive effort thing, you know, cognitive economy. They they don't work hard enough, and they gradually realize they right they they adjust and so forth. So, uh, or it could also be that this is a rather abstract kind of a notion. You know, in the payoff numbers are giving out very ab abstractly. And then what happens if we want to give, say we have a very concrete kind of reasoning paradigm, okay? Just like in the Wilson uh, cast selection task, right? So there's a difference between running an abstract reasoning game versus a, a concrete reasoning game, right? So um, we have uh, started running subjects by, uh, by actually giving them stories about you know, uh, this, a cover story for the three step reasoning. Say like a, a typical example would be an say application game. So like you apply for a college, okay? And the college can decide whether to accept or you, you can decide whether to apply to a college. The college can decide whether to accept or not accept. And then you can decide whether to go or not go to a college, right? So not that. So this is a very typical kind of a three-stage stage game. The applicant has a control of first and last step, and the university and you know, the college has control of the second step, right? So you can give a variety of payoff structures in terms of the desirability of all possible outcomes. The desirability in a sense of whether, say, a university would like more students to apply but reject them to, so that their rejection ratio can be higher, okay? Or the university can you know, have some you know, uh, preference for a person really they want, they want the person to come. And then uh, for the applicant, they can have a, a relative rankings of the outcome based on you know, maybe you know, their preference of the various outcome, right? So you apply, you reject, or you get accepted, but you reject. And so, so we give these scenarios and then have people reason on these scenarios and want to see any difference than the abstract reasoning task. But we don't have the result yet, but this is the direction that, uh, uh, that we're testing. But, but I think the question about uh, using those to train recursive reasoning, this is a very interesting question. Yeah, we, uh, we hope this sets of games can be useful towards that, that goal. Yes? In the history of theory of mind, um, there have been those who felt that the, the average onset of a working theory of mind uh, falls in the development of a child between yeah. five and seven years of age. But um, if a child is taught to play games at earlier ages, um, does it or does it not accelerate the development of a working theory of mind? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, so, so the typical developmental literature, the, 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 the time that they pin down is like between like three and four, you know, three and four and then so forth. But of course, this is a, like a, so as evidenced by like forced belief tasks and so forth, right? It does not involve a recursive, you know, a recursion, like a second. So uh, I'm not aware of the developmental literature about the recursion, okay, the recursion you know, at what age. I think at, uh, this would be an age where at, actually training would be possible because they can understand the structure. They can understand instructions, right? They can understand. So yes, one thing to try out is to see, you know, yeah, whether this, uh, you know, try, you know, re have them you know, reason through these games and whether that would help. And in fact, there are uh, groups, I think they are applying this to children. So this is group uh, I mentioned earlier. Our paradigm ha has been adopted by some, the group in Netherlands, one group in Netherlands, which are uh, play are being used uh, upon children and training uh, this 
the Verbrix, uh, Dr. Verbrix group in the Netherlands, they are uh, devising a, a concrete game of this sort, a three-step game in which they are actually running on children. Okay. And there are some other group, but the other groups are running them on adults. I think the first group is running on, on children. Okay. Yes. Did you find in, in uh, the data any um, evidence of social preferences? So, for example, like a person might, even though you told them to only look at their own payoffs, they might prefer where both the agents get three rather than passing it so they can get four, but the only person, other person will end up with one. Does that explain any of the non uh, Right. So it, this is a good question about, uh, say, uh, whether the, pers uh, the our subjects are playing as we instructed in terms of the playing as a non-cooperative game, right? And that's number one. The second is that because there is prolonged interaction, there is always this possibility of signaling. So in those they may play the first few games as a way, playing certain ways to signal the other person that they are playing this way so the other person can react in, in response or in, in kind, right? So that's kind of a, a, a like possibility, yeah. So uh, we, we checked a few of the heuristics about the playing of non cooperative for instance, if there is a, say, ending, say, if there is a, a higher number in the game, in the ending cell, in D, whether you should go on, based on heuristic, because everybody wants to go there. So we checked out some of this heuristic, but we hadn't systematically kind of you know, check you know, on the answers based on uh, the signaling part of it, because, but we did, you know, again, use this, uh, uh, these uh, catch trials, catch games, just to make sure that they are not doing anything like that. Because if they are doing anything like that, we may catch them, we may spot them in the catch, by the catch trials, and then the subject would get excluded. Uh, in the exit questionnaire, we asked them about strategy and so forth. They didn't mention that they are doing, that they are signaling the opponent. Okay. Uh, we had one manipulation of the apparent intelligence of a confederate. Okay, I will tell you that. So um, uh, in that manipulation, our confederate so comes in and uh, uh, so there are two uh, conditions. One is an uh, intelligent one is uh, like a not as intelligent one. So the in intelligent confederate comes in, uh, coming in a, a few minutes, uh, one, like a, a minute late and saying that, oh, uh, apologizing to the subject, I'm late because I'm just you know, tutoring uh, like a, 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 a tutoring a math you know, students and the session runs long and the person carries a mathematics kind of textbook and so forth. And then when sitting down, interacting with the subject and says that, okay, I'm um, the, the, uh, the leader or a member of the chess club in all honors college and so forth, calculus easy. And, and in the other condition, we say the person just carries uh, like a uh, supermarket tabloid and running late, apologizing that the, the, the calculus tutoring session is running too long and, uh, and finds calculus very difficult and uh, so, and then uh, just to uh, know, just if asked what the person wants to do, just to uh, know, just want to hang around, no, not declare any major. And so, so we run this, uh, 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 when run the manipulation, turns out, and then we ask for the you know, ratings for intelligence, friendliness, and so forth. Turns out, yeah, the manipulation did work in affecting the people's rating of intelligence. I'm surprised by the actual the, the outcome of this simple manipulation. And when we asked them to rate the opponent, I mean, the other person, that they did show that, but it didn't affect, it didn't affect the depth of reason at all. So there's no effect on the recursive depth. So uh, for this manipulation, so they, it's in either direction. So there's no effect on that. All right, we have a question outside and we can continue the discussion outside. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Okay.